Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Stuart Bland and I'm editor of Materials Today. I'd like to welcome you to our eighth Materials Today webinar of 2015 entitled Commercial Catalyst Behavior at Operational Temperatures and Pressures by High Resolution In Situ Electron Microscopy. Presented by Abaya Dattier, Distinguished Regents Professor and Department Chair, Chemical and Biological Engineering, University of New Mexico, and Larry Allard, Distinguished Research Staff Member, Material Science and Technology Division of Oak Ridge National Laboratory, with an overview by Dr. John DiMano, CTO of Protochips, and sponsored by Protochips. As you know, Materials Today strives to bring you educational webinars on some of the most exciting topics in material science as part of our webinar series. So be sure to visit our webinar page regularly to find out more about upcoming events and recordings of past webinars. But back to today, and it's now my pleasure to introduce and welcome today's speakers. Abiy Datier has been on the faculty of the University of New Mexico since 1984. From 1994 to 2014, he served as the director of the Center for Microengineered Materials, a strategic research center at UNM that reports to the vice president for research. The CNEM serves as the focal point for nanomaterials research on campus. He is also the founding director of the Graduate Interdisciplinary, Interdisciplinary Program in Nanoscience and Microsystems, the first program at UNM to span three schools and colleges at the Anderson Business School. He served as director of this program from 2007 to 2014. His research interests are in heterogeneous cat catalysis, materials characterization, and nanomaterial synthesis. His research group has pioneered the development of electron microscopy tools for the study of catalysts. By developing model catalysts for his work, his group has shown that the metal and oxide surfaces and interfaces in catalytic materials can be studied at near atomic resolution. His current work involves the synthesis of biorenewable chemicals, fundamental studies of catalyst sintering, alcohol reforming into H2, and synthesis of novel nanostructured heterogeneous catalysts. He serves the NSF Partnership for International Research and Education on conservation of biomass-derived reactants into fuels, chemicals, and materials. He was elected Fellow of the Microscopy Society of America in 2014. And now Larry Allard obtained all three of his degrees at the University of, Mi of, Mich of Michigan pardon, in the Material Science and Engineering Department. He started his electron microscopy career in 1964 as a sophomore, learning theory and practice under Professor Wilbur Bigelow. He is currently a Distinguished Materials Research Staff Member in DOE's High Temperature Materials Laboratory, a national user facility located at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. His research involves ultra-high resolution imaging and microanalysis studies of nanophase and nanostructured materials, automotive catalytic materials for exhaust after treatment, and instrumentational developments involving in situ electron microscopy, electron holography, digital imaging, and remote instrument operation. He is the chief scientist in charge of the Aberration Corrected Electron Microscope Project at the HTML. His JL2200 FS instrument is one of the first of the new generation of STEM TEM instruments with sub Armstrong re resolution to be installed in the US. He is also the principal technical designer of Oak Ridge's new Advanced Microscopy Laboratory, a facility housing the most advanced and sensitive modern electron beam instruments. Dr. Allard is the author or co-author of more than 250 scientific publications a co-organizer of more than a dozen workshops and symposia on, on advanced microscopy topics, and has co-edited several conference proceedings and, and books, including Introduction to Electron Holography, the first definitive textbook on electron holography. Dr. Allard was elected Fellow of the Microscopy Society of America in 2010, is the second in the second Fellows class of the Society. He is still collaborating closely with Professor Biglow, who at age 91 continues to contribute to the design and fabrication of a myriad of devices and systems that enable the development of the unique capabilities provided by the microscopy groups at Oak Ridge. So, after that introduction, let me remind the audience of the structure of today's event. The presentation will begin shortly. Following the presentations, we will have a question and answer session. I would encourage you to please input questions as and when you think of them during the presentation by using the Ask button on your screen. Questions will be addressed in the Q&A session at the end, and the more questions asked, the better the session will be, so please don't hesitate. Also, attention Twitter users. Please use the hashtag, hashtag MTWebinar when tweeting about the event or to reach out directly to the Materials Today team. And so, without any further delay, I'd like to begin and hand you over to Abiyé to begin his presentation. My name is Abai Date. 
I'm at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and the work that I'm going to describe to you involves the microstructure of platinum and palladium catalysts that are used for automotive exhaust catalysis. This work is being done in collaboration with General Motors R&D in a project that is supported by the National Science Foundation. Our work concerns uh, automotive exhaust catalysts that are placed underneath your car for cleaning up uh, the environment, uh, specifically pollutants that you don't want to see in the atmosphere. Uh, multiple reactions are carried out, and the main components of the catalyst involve platinum and palladium, which operate at high temperatures. Let me tell you why these catalysts need to be studied under atmospheric pressure at elevated temperatures. Controlling the gas pressure and composition is important. For example, let's consider catalysts that operate under reducing atmospheres. If you bring them to air, they transform irreversibly, and uh, we don't get to know how these catalysts might look under operating conditions. Sometimes, uh, in the same atmosphere, but cooling the catalyst might change things completely. Let's take the example of palladium combustion catalysts. We'll describe some of those later. They will transform from the oxide to the metal at elevated temperature, but they might reoxidize upon cooling. We'd like to know how they actually look, and I'll tell you why that's important as we go through this presentation. Lowering the pressure can be done and allows this technique of EPAM to function. You can modify an entire microscope and operate at low pressures. However, let's consider the formation of volatile platinum oxide, which is important in automotive catalysts. This reaction is first order in oxygen, which means oxygen pressure is very important. If you do observations in a few tar, we obviously cannot replicate what happens in the tailpipe of a car. For all these reasons, industry would be very interested in having the ability to study catalysts at operating temperatures and pressures. Uh, I will describe to you some work we did a few years ago on palladium combustion catalysts. Today, this is even more important because we have natural gas from fracking that allows methane to be used for transportation. But it is a potent greenhouse gas. You need to eliminate it, and therefore we need catalysts that will work to clean up the exhaust from these natural gas-powered engines. But this catalyst, as I told you, undergoes a change of phase, and therefore uh, we would like to know exactly how it looks under operating conditions. These complex catalytic phenomena cannot be understood without in situ studies at atmospheric pressure. Uh, let's take the example of this palladium catalyst. We will describe to you later some of the studies we did at atmospheric pressure uh, for palladium catalysts. But just to set the stage, let me tell you that these palladium catalysts are complex. If we start with the catalyst and just heat it up in air, uh, at some point the palladium oxide will decompose and form metallic palladium. This is a phenomenon that, of course, we have studied in the past, but only using ex situ microscopy. For also, upon cooling the catalyst, the catalyst will reoxidize. This graph shows the weight of the catalyst. The weight decreases when you lose oxygen, the weight increases when you gain oxygen. Clearly, the catalyst microstructure changes. We published this uh, some years back in collaboration with the researchers at Yale University. Um, we also did our best to try to study the microstructure of these catalysts. As I told you, these catalysts transform, uh, and then upon cooling, we won't be able to see what they look like. Therefore, we had to come up with a procedure filed quite complicated to actually quench these catalysts. We dumped them in liquid nitrogen, preserving the metallic nature. While this is fine, it is no substitute for actually being able to see the catalyst under operating conditions. This is a low magnification view showing what a typical palladium catalyst looks like. 
in summary, then, uh, if we aren't able to study them at atmospheric pressure, we are missing many of the interesting phenomena uh, that are needed to be understood to design better catalysts. For example, what happens when you take a catalyst, heat it up, and make it into metallic palladium? When you start cooling it down, this is the reactivity plotted uh, for methane oxidation as a function of temperature. What you will notice is that during cool down, the catalytic activity drops, but then regains itself. Why is that happening? Because what was metallic palladium now transforms to palladium oxide. But it doesn't completely transform. The microstructure is quite complex. Uh, we are only able to look at these catalysts after they have come to room temperature. So we really don't know how these phenomena happen. Here was our previous attempt trying to look at this to see the coexistence of palladium and palladium oxide. Again, very difficult to do because we can't preserve these catalysts at these uh, temperatures. Uh, another example where in-situ studies are needed are the diesel oxidation catalysts. Platinum is the catalyst of choice. The work done by George Graham at Ford and now at the University of Michigan shows that addition of palladium improves the durability of these catalysts. For example, here you can see how platinum by itself will grow to large particle sizes, but addition of palladium keeps the particle size more manageable. We know that the process involves Oswald ripening. We also suspect it involves a volatile platinum oxide. How exactly does this happen, and how does the palladium help? There's an interesting phenomenon that happens in these catalysts that George Graham uh, pointed out. We call that self-assembly. What is happening is that even a physical mixture of platinum and palladium, when heated in air, forms a bimetallic. Green represents a lattice constant. This is an X-ray diffraction pattern. The lattice constant for platinum palladium, somewhere between that of platinum and that of palladium. So you can see these catalysts have the self-healing property. Just heating them in air, they transform back. Clearly, palladium plays a major role in these catalysts. Not only does it help to keep the catalyst stable, but it also improves the catalytic reactivity. This was work done by Chang Kim and co-workers at GM, and it shows that pure platinum or pure palladium oxide is not as good for hydrocarbon oxidation. This is what diesel oxidation catalysts do. Platinum palladium does it very well. So uh, you can see that uh, these sorts of phenomena uh, all involve understanding the microstructure of these catalysts. Now, there's a, much of this webinar will focus on the phase transformations. And I want to point out that there are changes in catalytic behavior. Here is a plot of temperature and methane conversion. Uh, not sorry, this is propylene conversion. And what you find is that metallic palladium is more active than palladium oxide. But in practice, um, when the palladium is exposed to air, it forms palladium oxide. So a key question in our work in the past is to understand how we keep palladium in metallic form. So let me go ahead and illustrate some of the work we have done. This figure represents a summary of what we've learned so far with platinum palladium catalysts. Uh, I've shown you already that platinum forms very large particles. If we have platinum palladium, we learned that we keep the catalyst metallic, and there's a little bit of palladium oxide left on the support. If we just take pure palladium, it forms palladium oxide. So these are three different types of catalysts that you might, scenarios that you might see in an automotive uh, exhaust, diesel exhaust catalyst. We use a lot of techniques, all in situ, to study these processes. It's possible to do in situ spectroscopy with X-rays. This is X-ray absorption near edge spectroscopy, which shows us that if we have a platinum palladium catalyst, and that's the blue curve here, it remains metallic, uh, and uh, whereas pure palladium will transform to oxide. Now, 
we want to know what exactly happens at the surface. And X-ray absorption spectroscopy can't tell us that. You need electron microscopy. But these pictures were obtained after cooling the catalyst. The catalyst changed, as I told you, upon cooling. So do we really know that there is no surface oxide? We don't. And we need in situ studies at atmospheric pressure to really understand these phenomena. Uh, one aspect of the work that we will show you that is possible now to do in the in-situ, the gas cell uh, that is developed by protochips, we can measure the emission of atoms. In this particular work by Tyne Jones, we try to study the emission of atoms from platinum and palladium. We found that palladium by itself is rather stable at temperatures up to 800 degrees before it transforms into metallic palladium. Here are model catalyst images. The support is similar to the one you're going to see in the, later in this talk. There are palladium particles evaporated onto the silicon nitride. This here shows you schematically how much palladium we put on the surface. Five angstroms if it was spread as a uniform film. That is, and then what happens? When we heat it up to 800 degrees, we have measured very carefully and found that there is no emission of palladium from these catalysts. So palladium is rather involatile under these conditions. We will show you later uh, that under conditions used for accelerated aging, even palladium can become mobile. But platinum is a very different story. At low temperatures such as 800 C, we see a tremendous loss of platinum from the surface of these model catalysts. If we start with 500 picometers of platinum, heating it to 750, we've already lost a fair amount. By heating to 800, we lose a whole lot. So platinum is mobile, it is emitted, palladium is not at 800 degrees. This has big effect on the particle size distribution. Uh, you can see all these details in our published work. Uh, we have limited time in this webinar. I will move on and show you what exactly does palladium do. Well, we think it helps prevent the emission of platinum. And that is an important fact, but we'd like to study it in situ, and we hope that the gas cell eventually will show us why palladium helps to slow down uh, the emission of platinum. Now, there's one hint we have. If I look at this image here, you see there is an oxide forming on the side of the metallic particle. Well, that might help explain, but if you want to reduce the emission of platinum, you might think that the oxide should cover the entire particle. Well, we don't see that in the catalysts that have been cooled down, but once again, we haven't looked at these catalysts at atmospheric pressure. So we have documented clearly that the presence of palladium slows down the emission of platinum. Here you can see our measurements of the total amount of palladium, and we have indeed slowed it down. But we don't understand the mechanism of why that happens. So schematically, I show that here from our recent work that platinum emits a lot of atoms in the form of volatile platinum oxide or via surface diffusion, leading to growth of particles and loss of catalyst activity, which is why you have to get your car in tested every other year, at least in New Mexico, to check that it meets the EPA standards. Addition of palladium slows down this emission, so these arrows are not as thick as they were here. Why does that happen? Perhaps a shell of palladium oxide forms on the surface of platinum, but we haven't been able to see it. We therefore need in situ studies in order to be able to do this. So clearly, these are the kinds of uh, processes that we hope we will be able to study in the future using the gas cell developed by protochips. In summary, I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators on this work. Uh, we are working with a group of uh, scientists at GM Global Research, R&D at Warren, Michigan, uh, Michelle Vibenga, Gongchen Shi, Seo, Chang King, Mike Below, and Ray Lee. The model catalysts were developed at Eindhoven University of Technology. Hans Niemann's work and Peter Thune helped us in that project. 
Our early work on palladium combustion catalyst was done in collaboration with Lisa Tepperly, Maximum Dubowski at Yale University, and primarily the research group at the University of New Mexico, specifically Christian Carrillo, uh, Tyne Jones, John Jones, Hai Feng Shong, Andrew De La Riva, Eric Peterson, and Eric Chala all help. Our support, financial support, comes from the National Science Foundation, a grant for collaboration with industry, a goalie grant with General Motors, uh, some fellowship support for the students, our support for the international activities, and also work for some of the fundamental studies using the Department of Energy, um, basic energy sciences. And so with that, I'm going to sign off and turn it over to Larry Allard for the second part of this webinar. Hello, this is Larry Allard from Oak Ridge National Laboratory. I'm going to give uh, a description of some of the electron microscopy results we've uh, recently gotten that relate to the problems that uh, Professor Date just described. Uh, and this is controlled in situ electron microscopy at atomic, atomic resolution at uh, high temperatures and pressures using the protochips gas cell system. So I, I thought I'd start with the, uh, just to get everybody on the same um, page with a, a simple description of the, um, the STEM imaging that we're doing. We're doing bright field and dark field, so-called high angle annular dark field, and the um, uh, incident electron beam uh, hits the thin specimen and scans an arrestor. So there's a scanning transmission electron microscopy, and there are two detectors, one the bright field detector, looks at the electrons that are not scattered so much, uh, and that's by light elements, and the uh, annular high angle uh, dark field uh, detector looks at electrons that are scattered at uh, large angles, as you would find from high atomic number materials. And, and very simply, you can see the uh, palladium nanoparticles appear as, uh, in bright contrast on an aggregate of alumina, even with the 4% uh, lanthanum uh, which is actually heavier than palladium uh, in, the, uh, in the alumina structure. So um, everything that's bright in bright contrast is high atomic number of materials in the uh, images you're going to see. So the, um, uh, the details of the construction of the gas cell will be given in the third part of the talk by Dr. Damiano, and I'm just going to describe it in, uh, in schematically in brief. Uh, the upper left in this picture shows um, uh, the uh, little two millimeter by two millimeter uh, semiconductor uh, heater device, and it it has just been loaded with uh, a bit of catalyst powder, and then the catalyst powder shaken off, and the uh, semiconductor device, the semiconductor heater, ready to go into the uh, gas cell. And the gas cell is shown schematically. I want to go over this a little bit in detail. Uh, the electron beam comes down through a silicon nit thin silicon nitride membrane that, uh, that holds the catalyst powder. So the catalyst powder is actually on the bottom side of the membrane relative to the electron beam. And the heater is the, is a, uh, has holes in it. You can see the electron beam going through a, a hole in the heater. And the heater is, uh, is a ceramic, conductive ceramic that uh, uh, can heat up to a thousand degrees in a millisecond, uh, so we can use that to our advantage in, in all cases in the, uh, in the operation of the either heating or inside the gas cell. So the electron beam uh, goes through the silicon nitride, hits the sample, and all the resolution happens at that point. And anything that happens thereafter does not affect resolution. This is an important point because this will show why we can image atomic resolution at pressures up to a full atmosphere in the gas cell. And the electrons that go through the sample scatter through the gas and, and down through a 50 nanometer uh, thin amorphous silicon nitride window and then onto those bright field and dark field detectors. The nominal gas path is uh, about five microns uh, as set up initially and the, um, uh, and the uh, cell will distend to some extent when it's heated up and with high gas pressures to maybe double that amount. The next slide shows the controller and uh, uh, the control system on the uh, computer and the uh, atmosphere manifold, the gas manifold system that uh, provides gas 
uh, to the holder in the microscope from the computer. Uh, you can see three lines on the left-hand side, uh, quick disconnect for the three different gases to go in. And this will be shown in more detail later on, but I wanted to uh, just indicate uh, on the uh, computer control GUI that the, um, there are a couple of tanks for uh, supplying gas to the holder, and one tank is shown highlighted that would have, say, oxygen or nitrogen or whatever you choose in that tank. And the, the, all the valves are solenoid valves that are operated from the computer, and the gas can be supplied at any pressure uh, to the cell up to an atmosphere pressure. Uh, the upper right-hand panel uh, describes or lets you do the, the uh, setup of the experiment and uh, running the experiment. And the most important part of this is the uh, data log that goes on minute by minute by minute uh, uh, that uh, records the, the temperature and the pressure in the cell, and that can be related directly to, or correlated directly to the time stamp on every image. So you, have, uh, you don't have to write down times. You have a, a direct running record of your experiment. Uh, this is extremely important to the experimentalist. Uh, temperatures are automatically adjusted for composition, pressure, and flow rate, as indicated, uh, and that can be, that'll be discussed in more detail by Dr. Damiano. So how does this uh, work in, uh, in real life? Uh, the next uh, two or three images show the results of uh, imaging through uh, crystalline uh, barium serrate material. This happened to be platinum dope, but we weren't at high enough temperature to bring platinum out. But this is just looking at the barium serrate structure. So uh, this image is through the gas cell, and you can see it. original magnification was 8 million X, and this is... Um, showing the lattice structure of a couple of grains. It's a very nice image, and it's at only 35 torr of, uh, of reducing gas at 500 degrees centigrade. Uh, this is important uh, uh, because this is three or four times higher than the pressure that can be achieved in any so-called environmental TEM in which the gas is admitted into the objective lens of the microscope, and there are lots of differential pumps and and uh, the, but the maximum pressure that can be achieved in that kind of uh, a system uh, that costs $5 million uh, is about uh, 8 or 10 torr. So we call a low pressure 35 torr, and we get this beautiful atomic resolution. And this image is my image. Uh, it's a material provided by Professor Pan at the University of Michigan. And if we look at the... Um, uh, image that uh, we get at 300 torr by just adding uh, gas to the cell and the temperature adjusted uh, uh, to compensate for the, the extra gas back to 500 degrees centigrade, you can see very nicely the um, resolution hasn't changed to any significant extent. And at, further, at a 700 torr, which is very close to atmospheric pressure, uh, the uh, temperature or the uh, image is, again, atomic resolution without any uh, significant reduction in resolution. This next slide shows a, a calcium titanate uh, particle image taken at the University of Michigan on a JOL2100F uh, aberration corrected electron microscope, similar to the JOL2200FS aberration corrected instrument uh, at our laboratory in Oak Ridge. The uh, particle is uh, on axis, a thin flake of calcium titanate. Uh, it's doped with rhodium, and you can see the um, uh, a very bright atomic column uh, indicated uh, uh, as uh, probably having at least a rhodium atom, uh, one rhodium atom in it uh, uh, in the um, in the right-hand image, and you, the magnification marker uh, shows the uh, excellent resolution that's achieved at atmospheric pressure in this 500 or 5 percent hydrogen nitrogen uh, gas at 500 degrees centigrade. Okay, we're going to look at a series of uh, platinum on lanthana alumina uh, catalysts that are uh, materials that we're working with on, with Professor Date and, and uh, the folks at uh, GM. And the first, the, the cartoon on the left here shows the sequence of, of uh, images that we're going to show. And the first ones, the uh, conditions are given up in the um, uh, top of the slide here. And... This image shows a typical aggregate of lanthana alumina. The bright uh, particles are 
the palladium particles. This image was taken at 200 degrees centigrade uh, in the vacuum, uh, and it, it allows us to locate the particles that we want to uh, be able to characterize at higher magnification during the progress of the oxidation processes that we're going to do, as shown by the cartoon on the left-hand side. So the first set of images uh, lets us look at a few of these particles. Uh, this is, for example, particle B. Uh, the lattice is shown in dark field. Uh, this is original magnification, probably about 5 million X. And uh, we can see the um, a condition of the particle as received in the sample, the as received sample at 200 degrees centigrade in vacuum. The uh, next image is particle C. Uh, it also shows lattice in the dark field. It's a little more easily visible. Uh, these particles are fairly large for lattice imaging uh, or atomic column imaging, uh, in the, even in the aberration corrected microscope. But the bright field images show those particles. Uh, those lattice fringes in the particles very, very nicely. So uh, this just shows uh, that we do have uh, lattice directly out to the edge. There's no apparent oxide on the surface. And particle D, uh, this is interesting because it, it, uh, can sh it shows a few little dark spots in that we believe are voids. We've uh, imaged voids in uh, palladium uh, nanoparticles in the past and, and uh, published that work some time ago. And this shows the particle at uh, higher magnification, uh, particle E at higher magnification, uh, and shows that the in, in bright field you can see the lattice goes all the way to the to the uh, surface of the particle. And this one shows a twin. Most particles are single crystal or maybe have a few twins. Uh, and this is particle G, uh, the final one we're looking at at uh, at uh, 200 degrees centigrade uh, in the vacuum. So the as-received sample allows us to uh, make a few observations on the uh, as-reduced material that we got. The, the particles are smooth, have smooth surfaces. Uh, they're generally spheroidal, uh, generally single crystals with uh, some twins, as you, as, you, as you have observed. And the profile suggests that there is non-wetting with the support. Uh, we'll then do an oxi uh, the first oxidation run. Uh, at 130 tor of oxygen, we chose 130 tor of oxygen to uh, match up uh, appropriately with the uh, with the partial pressure of oxygen at the elevation of the um, uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and to match up with the results that have been done at the Univers University of New Mexico. So the the first slide and at 300 degrees C. And 130 tor of oxygen shows the original particle B at uh, 200 degrees C in the vacuum, and the after 130 tor at 300 degrees centigrade for some time, you can see some changes already occurring in the particle. I think the particle is just beginning to oxidize. It's becoming a little bit more irregular, and that's matched up with uh, a similar effect on particle C, 200 degrees C in vacuum versus 300 degrees C uh, at 130 tor of oxygen. You can see, again, it's becoming a little bit more irregular. And particle D uh, shows a few voids. The voids have centered out to some extent. Uh, and, again, there's a, a little bit more irregularity in the particle uh, at um, 130 tor and 300 degrees centigrade. And finally, uh, particle G uh, again shows this uh, developing irregularity as it's just beginning to oxidize. So the oxidation at 300 degrees centigrade, uh, we just started to see oxidation. Uh, this, the differences in contrast suggest the that we have some palladium, remaining palladium and some palladium oxide. And we saw this also in lattice fringes that we don't uh, show details of. And the particles start to become irregular. So then we went to 500 degrees C to do the oxidation at 500 degrees C and 130 tor of, of oxygen. And here we start to see some real dramatic changes in the particle. Uh, particle B, for example, at 130, at 130 tor and 300 degrees centigrade, 
uh, at 500 degrees centigrade has changed dramatically. It, uh, it's probably becoming uh, more fully oxidized. We think that uh, the particles are all essentially fully oxidized uh, at 500 degrees centigrade. We see a similar fairly dramatic change in particle C at 500 degrees centigrade, and not so much of a change uh, in, uh, uh, in particle D, uh, but it was just sitting right at the tip of the, um, of the alumina. Maybe that uh, alumina uh, structure had some effect on the uh, shape of that particle. Uh, so the conclusions that we have after 500 degrees centigrade, uh, we've completely um, oxidized the particles. They're very irregular. Uh, single crystals have essentially transformed into polycrystalline material, and we did subsequent heating at higher temperatures that uh, uh, we saw some changes that we're not going to show in this uh, presentation, and we want to jump directly to the uh, ultimate high temperature of 1,000 degrees centigrade that, uh, where we basically see uh, uh, dr more dramatic changes. These, this is a temperature at which three-way catalysts are aged, and this shows the dramatic changes at the, um, after the high temperature. You can see on the left the um, palladium particles in the as-received sample, and on the right the palladium particles have completely disappeared after the high temperature aging. So what we did was uh, we wanted to see if we had residual palladium on the surface, and we then decided to reduce the sample to uh, see if we could reform the palladium particles, if there was any palladium left. So we cooled it to 300 degrees centigrade and exposed it to 100 tor of uh, hydrogen argon, actually at 4% hydrogen and argon at uh, 300 degrees centigrade. And we saw no re reformation of uh, individual nanoparticles of palladium, but we did see some, at lower magnification, some interesting white lines that appeared that seemed to outline the grains in the aluminum oxide. And this uh, next couple of slides shows the real dramatic uh, imaging uh, effect that we, uh, that we got uh, uh, and the fact that you can image uh, uh, single atoms and uh, uh, at the uh, atoms at the atomic level, at the level of single atoms in the uh, gas cell at uh, the conditions that we're observing these. And this is the uh, alumina, and we see basically a lanthanum uh, on the surface in, uh, in decorating the edges of the, of, the part of the surfaces and therefore the edges and ledges in the particle, particle support particles. And the next slide shows even uh, some additional dramatic uh, effects of lanthanum uh, atoms decorating the um, uh, defects and, and edges and ledges and surfaces and the uh, support particles. So this gives a, a very dramatic uh, uh, picture of the capability of uh, imaging in the gas cell. We used EDS analysis on the heater ex situ, but we didn't detect the presence of palladium either on the alumina aggregates or on the silicon nitride membrane surfaces adjacent to any aggregate. So we used XPS to look at the surface of the silicon nitride bottom window. The XPS beam covered nearly the entire window as shown by the green oval in the optical image from the XPS system. A small palladium peak distinctly above background seen in the inset spectrum confirmed that the palladium atoms were adsorbed onto the window. We have a lot more gas cell work to do to fully understand the behavior of the palladium species in this system under reaction conditions. So there are a number of conclusions uh, based on those observations uh, at the high temperature uh, uh, and uh, we basically overall uh, doc have documented that heating in 130 tor of oxygen uh, that we oxidized the palladium at uh, 1,000 degrees centigrade. Uh, we emitted palladium from the support services. Uh, the uh, lanthana uh, migrated and uh, decorated the alumina services and grain boundaries. And we did a similar experiment with the gas cell open to the atmosphere. And it basically showed full emission of palladium oxide particles uh, 
as with the 130 tor oxida uh, uh, ox oxygen oxidation results. I'd like to acknowledge the uh, work that we've done uh, with uh, uh, the folks at the University of Michigan that we've shown results here. Professor Bigelow uh, uh, has been working with me and with Protochips for a number of years to develop all of these uh, technologies, uh, new technologies, and the experiments uh, conducted with Professor Date and Michelle Wibanga at uh, GM Global Research, and then all the folks at uh, Protochips Company, but most specifically our work at Oak Ridge National Lab is DOE-funded, uh, Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, and at the Vehicle Technologies Office and the Propulsion Materials Program. We're grateful to all the folks for all their work. Uh, Dr. Damiano from Protochips will uh, follow with the description of all the hardware and the technology of the gas cell. Thanks, Larry. Hi, my name is John Damiano, and I'm the CTO of Protochips. Protochips develops and sells analytical tools for scientists and engineers in materials and life sciences. For the last 10 years, we've been focused on developing in situ solutions for markets that need to analyze samples in non-vacuum environments. Our products transform the most widely used tools in nanotechnology, electron and light microscopes, from cameras into complete nanoscale laboratories that help advance the study of materials in ways that were previously not possible. Our systems are based on MEMS devices, or E-chips, that provide in situ heating, electrical stimulus, and liquid and gas environments to samples during imaging and analysis. Our product lines include a Duro, which is used to heat samples to 1200 degrees C, apply peak lamp level electrical stimulus, and perform thermal and electrical studies simultaneously. Our Poseidon systems are used to image hydrated samples in their native environment. The Poseidon 200 is useful for biological samples and wet samples such as paints, inks, and gels. The Poseidon 500 combines liquid imaging with a potentiostat and a variety of e-chips for in-situ in electrochemistry with applications in batteries and fuel cells. The product that we're highlighting today is our newest, the Atmosphere 200. The Atmosphere 200 gives the user complete control of a sample's temperature and gas environment under true reaction conditions. Researchers have wanted these capabilities for a very long time and developed ex situ workflows in an attempt to stimulate, simulate reaction environments. But the Atmosphere 200 is an entirely new class of in-situ system. Previously, users wanting in-situ gas reaction capability had to choose between simple holders or environmental TEMs. Simple holder-only solutions are inexpensive, certainly more so than an ETEM, but they provide very limited capabilities. Sometimes these are gas only, without heat, or they have a heating capability that's uncompensated over gas pressure. The gas layer around the sample can be quite thick, which impacts resolution at higher pressures. A standalone holder doesn't offer the capability to control gas flow and pressure, which are critical for ease of use and for obtaining quantifiable data from reproducible experiments. Perhaps more importantly, a holder-only approach does not address safety for either the microscope or its operator. The alternative to holder-only solutions is the ETEM. ETEMs use differential pumping rather than a thin window to contain a gas environment around the holder tip. These systems are fully integrated into the microscope, so they offer a higher level of safety versus a holder-only approach. The ETEM's open cell design without a window between the beam and the sample can also improve resolution, but it places a significant constraint on maximum gas pressure at the sample. Gas pressure is limited to about one kilopascal, which is far lower than typical reaction conditions for most catalyst materials. Another important consideration is cost. By design, ETEMs are dedicated instruments. The cost of the instrument and its gas handling systems far exceeds a standard TEM with comparable resolution. And beyond the instrument cost, most labs require facility upgrades to safely store and supply gases to the ETEM. The Atmosphere 200 provides an alternative to these two traditional solutions. It combines high performance with features that are completely unique, with built-in automation and safety at an attractive price point. And it's compatible with all JEOL, FEI, or Hitachi TEMs and STEMs. The design of the Atmosphere 200 enables atomic resolution imaging at pressures up to one atmosphere and temperatures up to 1,000 degrees C. This combination of temperature and pressure range meets the needs of industrial and academic researchers that must accurately reproduce reaction conditions for catalysts and other materials. And its resolution enables analysis of nanoparticle catalyst materials that are increasingly used in industrial applications. The Atmosphere 200 features closed loop temperature control that can compensate for varying levels of conve convective forces from different gases across pressures from vacuum to one atmosphere and maintain accurate temperature at the sample. Gas handling and control of sample temperature and pressure are completely automated through workflow-driven software 
designed to let users focus on the experiment and not on the system itself. Safety is built into the Atmosphere 200 with features that prevent unsafe operating conditions and shut off gas flows if a leak is detected. At the heart of the Atmosphere 200 system are specially designed MEMS devices, or E-chips. Two E-chips, a heating device and a window device, are used to support the sample, heat it, and contain the gas layer around it. At the center of a heating device is a thin, semiconducting silicon carbide membrane. Forcing current through the silicon carbide layer causes dual heating of the membrane and its temperature is proportional to current. This carbide film is strong and is capable of heating to very high temperatures. Atop this carbide film is a thin layer of silicon nitride which covers holes formed in the silicon carbide layer. Silicon nitride is an excellent sample support for TEM. Thin yet robust, inert, and amorphous, it allows for atomic resolution imaging and collection of analytical signals from the sample. Finally, a thick layer of gold on the heater chip sets the difference between a pair of E-chips when they're stacked in the holder. These diagrams illustrate the holder tip design and how the E-chips are loaded into the tip. The heater and window devices are different sizes. First, the smaller device is loaded into the tip. An O-ring sits below this device to form a seal between the E-chip and the holder. Next, the larger device is loaded into the holder atop the small device. A second O-ring sits between the holder and the larger device, fully surrounding the smaller device. Finally, the lid is attached with three small screws. When the lid is screwed down, the O-rings below each E-chip are compressed, forming a hermetic seal between the E-chips and the holder tip. It also pushes the two chips together with the gas layer thickness between the E-chips set by the thick gold layer on the smaller chip. A uniform thin gas layer is critical for achieving the highest possible resolution. Holder assembly is designed to be fast and easy. Here's a schematic cross-section of the holder to better illustrate the assembled tip and how gases enter and exit the cell. O-rings below each chip form a seal to the holder and confine gases to the area between the E-chips. The gap between the E-chips is set by the gold layer thickness. The membranes on each chip are aligned and centered on holes in the holder tip to allow the electron beam to pass through the gas layer. Gases are introduced between the E-chips through tubes that enter the tip in the space between the O-rings. An important point to note is that either the large E-chip or the small E-chip can be the heating device. This is important for optimizing sample resolution. For stem imaging, the larger E-chip should be the heater on top, while for TEM imaging, the lower E-chip should be the heater on the bottom. Both options are supported. Once the holder is loaded and inserted into the TEM, the atmosphere software takes over. This figure from the software GUI illustrates the design of the gas manifold. Three gases can be introduced into the manifold, typically two reaction gases, for example, hydrogen and oxygen, and a purge gas, for example, nitrogen. Gas mixtures can also be pre-filled into gas cylinders, or the atmosphere system can be connected directly to a separate gas mixing system. Inside the manifold are two supply tanks that can be filled with any gas to target pressure. There's also a vacuum tank used to quickly evacuate the holder, help regulate pressures, and also collect reactant gases under flowing conditions. Pressure sensors on each tank and on the holder supply lines allow the user to track and record pressure during the experiment. There are valves between all the gas supply lines, tanks, and the holder that allow the user to quickly evacuate the tanks and segments of the manifold before the experiment and when gases are switched. Not shown in this diagram are heaters used to bake out the tanks and manifold between experiments. This figure illustrates the atmosphere software during operation. The manifold image just described is in the upper left corner of the window during the experiment and it provides a constant update on the system status, which gases are in which tank, the temperature and pressure in the holder, and which valves are open and closed. The most important status, holder temperature and pressure, are displayed in large font for fast, at-a-glance updates. In the upper right is the workflow panel. The software is designed to follow a typical user workflow, from initial loading and system check, pump purge cycles and leak checks, to automating the gas pressure and sample temperature during the experiment. All of these functions are user programmable. In the lower left is the data recorder panel. All pressures and temperatures are recorded versus time for the duration of the experiment and a log file. We described the system and its features, and Dr. Allard shared some data that gathered with the system in his lab. I'd like to reiterate that the system is designed such that the performance is not compromised under reaction conditions. Let's start by talking about resolution. Here you see images of a titanium dioxide sample in anatase form. The sample was imaged in STEM mode at 300 keV in an ARM 300F at 7.5 torr nitrogen and 500 degrees C. It's clear that very high resolution, here down to 88 picometers, is possible under these conditions while imaging through a gas cell with thin nitride windows.
but the focus isn't simply on resolution. Many modern microscopes also support various types of analytical instrumentation that can be used in situ. This slide demonstrates the EDS capabilities of the atmosphere system. The EDS data was collected at room temperature with one atmosphere of air in the cell. The sample is a platinum cobalt catalyst material and gold nanoparticles were added to the sample. The design of the atmosphere 200 holder tip allows EDS signal to be collected through the top E-chip. The distribution of platinum, cobalt, and gold at the nanoscale is easily seen in the EDS maps. Tracking the sample's composition over temperature helps the user understand the impact of sintering or oxidation reduction cycles on the catalyst material under reaction conditions. EELS is another popular technique for determining the composition of a sample, and the Atmosphere 200 is also fully compatible with EELS. The sample in these images is a gold nanoparticle catalyst on an iron oxide support. This data was collected at 1 atmosphere hydrogen and at 900 degrees C. EELS maps of iron and oxygen peaks are coupled with stem images to better understand the distribution of iron under reducing conditions. Iron coalesces to form large round particles during reduction of iron oxide. The ability to use both EDS and EELS under reaction conditions, along with other analytical techniques, is a huge benefit to researchers trying to understand the behavior of catalyst materials in the real world. I'd like to close by thanking you for your time for participating in this webinar. I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Dottier and Dr. Allard for their participation. We're very excited about the Atmosphere 200 product and its applications in catalyst science. Thank you again. Great. Well, thank you very much for your presentations uh, by uh, Larry and John. And this brings us to the end of today's presentations and on to our question and answer session. Um, I can see there have been plenty of uh, questions coming in, but do keep sending them through. And if you do have a question for a particular uh, one of our presenters today, do just indicate that in the, in the uh, questions box as well. Um, otherwise, I'll, I'll throw it open to our, to our, our panelists. Um, so I'll begin with a question to John. And we have a user who works with yes. steel samples, and uh, uh, they mainly do FIB sample prep. And they want to know, is atmosphere compatible with FIB sample preparation techniques? Uh, that's a great question. Now, before I start, I'd like to point out that the background you're seeing right now is actually uh, our atmosphere software in operation during a typical experiment. Um, yes, regarding FIB, uh, FIB sample prep can, can absolutely be done with our system. Uh, FIB is an increasingly popular technique for sample prep. We have several customers that use FIB for all of our products, uh, Enduro, Atmosphere, and uh, Poseidon. Customers use both in situ and ex situ lift out procedures to mount FIB specimens on the heating membrane. Uh, the main concerns are just those sort, those sort of things that are common to all FIB prep, for example, uh, gallium implantation into the sample and the impact that has on uh, imaging and analysis. Uh, but, but absolutely, FIB is definitely a, a useful technique for our system. Fantastic. Um, I believe this is a question for, for Larry as it came in while, uh, while Larry was presenting, but Abaya, do jump in if, if, uh, if, it, if, it, if you think it, it's for one of you. But um, um, uh, on one of your graphs, there was a, a, gramp, a graph showing a ramp of temperatures, and you used 5% uh, palladium. Uh, a delegate wants to know why you used 5% and not another percentage of palladium. I don't think that's a question for me. 5% palladium? We didn't have 5% palladium in our <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was um, less than that. I think it was, if I'm not mistaken, maybe one and a half percent. But uh, the point is, uh, we used the odd-looking uh, pressure of oxygen because we were trying to mimic the oxygen pressure in Albuquerque. So we used 130 tar of oxygen, but uh, we certainly did not use five percent, and I believe it was lower than that. Okay, thank you. Uh, so this one definitely is a question for, for Larry, uh, and it concerns the imaging at atomic resolution of the particles. Um, right. uh, imaging the particles at high resolution through two uh, uh, SIN membranes and a small volume of gas at high pressure, uh, does this require significantly more electron intensity compared to regular TEM grid-based imaging at UHV? Uh, no, it doesn't. All of the uh, resolution happens with the electron beam just passing through the 30 nanometer thick silicon nitride uh, top window, or top heater membrane, and then onto the sample. And the sample is right under that membrane. After that, it's just scattered electrons, and the electrons scatter down through the gas, through the bottom window, and into the detectors. And all the, the gas in the bottom window add to it is a little bit of noise. So we don't use any special conditions. 
Fantastic. Um, this one, maybe maybe everyone can, can, can comment a little bit on, maybe. Um, uh, the user's asking, how do you make real catalyst specimens thin enough for the cells? <laughs> Uh, I think the essence is that when you disperse the catalyst powder onto the membrane, and this is true for any TEM imaging, if it is a powder, all you have to make is a dilute dispersion and spread it out, and then it is thin enough. Now, if it is a monolithic catalyst, you'll have to do some preparation. Perhaps Larry can say something about, you know, microtoming and the other techniques that one might use. You wouldn't but, use microtome techniques uh, in particular for doing these kinds of experiments. We just use catalyst powders, and we make sure the aggregates are small enough so that we don't have an aggregate larger than five microns, because then that would contact the, the between the heater and the bottom window. So uh, we make sure that the dispersion is such that there are much smaller aggregates of uh, material uh, on the heater. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, question for John now on, on the system side. Um, we've got a user that, that wants to age materials over long periods at high temperatures. How long can you keep the sample at high temperature? We, we've often tested our heating e chips, and this is true for our Duro system as well. Uh, our typical test for age would be to uh, test the chips over a 24 hour period and longer, and even longer soak times, and then measure uh, at the temperature throughout that test. We've been able to maintain accurate temperature. Uh, through those long soaks, so I think that would be a, that would definitely be an appropriate time for these types of experiments. Great. Um, got a few questions about the different materials that that that, that maybe um, you can look at with with systems such as these. Um, so one user asking about applications on um, or, or whether there are any applications on unsupported bulk oxide catalysts, uh, and another user asking about tech, whether they can use this technique to look at carbon materials such as uh, activated carbon or, or fullerene. Any comments on those? Well, when you're using high-angle annular dark field imaging, of course you rely on contrast due to atomic number. So just carbon by itself is not going to give you a great deal of contrast, but any metals on the carbon will show up really clearly. And there's really no fundamental limitation on using oxides. Uh, one could study oxides just as well as any other catalyst. Uh, Larry, maybe you want to say something? No, that uh, you covered exactly what I would say. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, got a question on particle size. Um, what are the advantages of particle size of, of the palladium and platinum to show high activity? Uh, I'm not sure I got the question. Obviously, if a reaction is structure sensitive, particle size is important and it then affects reactivity. So there are reactions where very small particles are better than large particles, but there are other reactions where, like NO oxidation, where the larger particle may be better. So this is really very specific to each reaction, uh, the role of particle size. I mean, here we're just trying to image the actual working catalyst under conditions close to its operation. Okay, thank you. Um, another one for John uh, on, uh, on, on the system again. Um, how easily and quickly can the, can the holder be loaded, and, and how difficult is it, really? Uh, in short, it, it's pretty easy. Uh, our primary focus when designing the holder was ease of use. Um, we've, we've designed the holder so that it quickly creates and, and maintains a hermetic seal. Um, the holder that, that we're uh, selling now is our fourth generation gas oil holder, and with each generation we've made it uh, easier to use. Like, like any microscopy tool, it takes some practice uh, to learn how to use it and optimize your technique, uh, but loading generally takes just a few minutes. Fantastic. I think we've got just enough time for, for maybe one more question. Um, again, going back to, to some of the, the graphs we saw earlier, um, do you know the ratios of, of palladium to palladium oxide at each temperature? Um, yes, it is, uh, of course, going to be dependent on uh, how long you keep it at that temperature. So in this case, they were very rapid experiments. So clearly, if you just keep it for a very short time, you'll build up a little bit of oxide, keep it longer, and um, then, of course, you'll build up more oxide. So uh, I'm not sure if we can answer directly mm -hmm. for these specific experiments. It would depend on uh, how long we keep it. These were just initial studies to demonstrate the technique. Great, thank you. I'm just going to be cheeky and sneak in one, one final question uh, to you again, John. Um, does the sample react with the substrate, or, or in other words, is the heating uh, surface robust and chemically inert when you get to these high temperatures? Uh, that, that's a great question. Um, 
In short, no, not often. Uh, the, the thin film heating membrane uh, that we make is silicon carbide, and it's coated with a layer of silicon nitride. These are ceramic materials, and we chose them for this application because they're very chemically inert, mm -hmm. and they stay inert even at high temperatures. Fantastic. Well, I'm afraid that's all the time we're going to have for questions today, but uh, thank you everyone for, for submitting your questions, and any questions that we were unable to answer today will of course pass on to the speakers, uh, and they'll be able to get back to you uh, separately. I'd like to thank, thank, take this opportunity to thank uh, Abaya and Larry and John uh, for their excellent presentations and for answering all your questions. Uh, I'd also like to thank the, all the attendees once again, and I hope you've all enjoyed the presentations as much as I have. Please don't forget that there'll be a recording of this webinar that will be available here on materialsday.com very shortly. And that just leaves me just enough time to say thank you to everyone involved once again and wish you all a great day. Thank you.